All right. And you'll introduce me. Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Welcome to our next edition of Museum Time Machine, uh, Destination Creepy Crawly with Joe Corneal. Um, I've known Joe for several years now, and I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I've sent him a lot of questions over the last few weeks about insects, so I'm pretty excited. Um, just so everyone knows, we are recording and we are live on Facebook. We welcome questions anytime using the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments on the Facebook, and I will get them to Joe as they come in. Um, go ahead, Joe. Okay, thanks. So as Amber just said, I, my name is Joseph Cornell, and I am an affiliate faculty member in the biology department, and I'm now an affiliate curator of invertebrates for the Idaho Museum of Natural History, and I'm very pleased to be with you today. Um, uh, I am interested in invertebrates, uh, mostly insects and arachnids. And so uh, over the past 10 years, I've helped create a collection of insects and arachnids. You can see some here in the background in Cornell drawers, and um, no relationship to me. Uh, they were developed by people at Cornell University. But I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, insects and arachnids and the collection and what we use it for. And then um, uh, we can take some questions. Uh, people have always got questions about spiders and about uh, bugs in their house. So I expect there will be uh, at least some interest in that. All right. so. Um, we have a collection now of about 5,000 invertebrates that uh, have been created while I teach the two classes that I've been teaching the last 10 years, invertebrate zoology and general entomology. And so 5,000 invertebrates, and what do we mean by that? So invertebrates are animals without backbones. Uh, fish, birds, mammals, lizards and snakes, they all have a backbone. And even more important, they have, a, they have a cranium, they have a noggin on the top of their head. And uh, that's the group craniata. So invertebrates is just about everything that doesn't have a spine or a cranium. So invertebrates includes all sorts of uh, uh, animals, uh, from single-celled animals to uh, very complex animals like giant squid uh, from, the, from the most basic kind of uh, organisms to very complicated animals with lots of behavior. Uh, there's Annelida, there's the worms, such as earthworms, you know about those. Mollusca, things like clams and mussels, squids, snails. And then uh, Cnidaria, jellyfish, sea anemones, um, and Echinodermata. So we're familiar with all of these common names, sea stars and, and sea urchins, uh, earthworms and so on. And uh, these are all phyla. In, uh, of invertebrates. Uh, the invertebrates also include arthropods. So the arthropods, the two big groups are the insects and the arachnids, but the arthropods also include things like centipedes and millipedes. And uh, I'm interested in these uh, organisms um, because uh, I haven't got any idea why. No, uh, I started teaching in 2011 and the class that was available to teach was invertebrate zoology at ISU. So I started learning more and more about these. But I'd always been interested in collecting butterflies. I started out collecting butterflies. And then uh, I moved on to learning how to identify spiders. And uh, over the past uh, eight, nine years, I have become better and better at uh, collecting and identifying. And the collection is both the product and the tool to allow me to do this. So collections-based research, collection-based teaching, that's what the museum does, right? So it's not just having these things, it's using them to uh, increase your knowledge and to help share that knowledge with other folks. And so today I'd like to tell you about the collection we have in the biology department. So most of these invertebrates were collected by myself and my children actually Lots of the little labels on them say Holden Cornell, or they'll say Catherine Cornell, and it will have the year that we collected them. And very often we'll all go out on a, a, a trip, we'll walk down a country road in Montana somewhere up in the mountains, and each person's got a butterfly net. And by the way, nothing makes a grown man look crazier than a butterfly net. But um, 
we'll collect and then at the end of the trip uh, we'll pin the insects and we will uh, put them into Cornell drawers uh, and identify them and put labels on them and uh, make them into something more than just that dead insect or that dead butterfly or that dead spider because it's without the data that goes along with it it is just a dead animal and kind of a shame there's a purpose to doing this uh, you shouldn't go out and just collect butterflies and kill them. Uh, you don't need to do that to enjoy them or to identify them. So uh, the collection is uh, has got a, a real purpose for teaching and outreach. All right, so we use this collection to teach the students about diversity. We start with the local diversity. If students uh, have a relative somewhere, uh, they're allowed to send the student, the relatives can send the student an insect or a spider uh, that they've collected in the house. We've uh, got some really interesting hornets, for example, from Iowa that were collected by Grandma Bobby, one of the students. And it, that's all it says, you know, on the on the label, collected by Grandma Bobby. But then all the other information is uh, uh, correct. We have some uh, cockroaches from Hawaii that were sent in little package of alcohol uh, to another student from a grandfather. So students learn how to collect. There's different techniques, not just butterfly nets, but pitfall traps and sticky traps and so on. You collect at night, you collect during the day, um, and uh, then they learn how to prepare and identify the specimens. So the beginning of this is you've got to collect. It's pretty easy to collect a bunch of stuff. It's much harder and time consuming to prepare specimens, especially to make the labels that, that need to go with each specimen to convert it from just a, a dead animal into data. And then uh, the third thing we try and do is learn how to identify. And that's, that's hard because, for example, there's a million species of beetles. And you really can't become an expert on more than a couple thousand of them. And in one semester, you, you're going to collect maybe 20 different kinds of beetles. Maybe learn how to identify collection for. Um, these are actually students in invertebrate zoology in the spring of 2018, and they're learning how to collect from soil. Uh, I've got uh, right here, nope, that's not it, but right here is a, a, a little dish with some uh, grass and soil underneath. And what they do is they shake the, shake the grass and the soil drops out, and then they can put some of that soil underneath a dissecting scope and look for uh, animals moving. And then you may see that in their hands they've got uh, a paintbrush. So you dip a paintbrush in some ethanol, which is uh, regular alcohol, and then you weigh and you, and you get it and you put it into the alcohol. And these are very small invertebrates. You, they make uh, microscope slides with them. So instead of putting them into um, uh, a uh, Cornell drawer like that for display, you have to look at them underneath a microscope. Anyway, so your students in invertebrate zoology working in the classroom that I, I teach in. And uh, we not only use the, uh, the students to collect the specimens, we use the specimens to test the students. So over the years, we've collected, uh, as I said, about 5,000 uh, invertebrates, mostly insects and uh, other arthropods. But um, then for a, a lab practical, we set up all these microscopes here and the students will go down to each station and they will look at the organism in the page. And they'll be uh, on the, the test paper, there'll be questions like, how many eyes does the spider have? Or how does this organism use its legs? How many legs does this organism have? On Do outreach, and you know we're doing some outreach here today. So I'm going to uh, be telling you about my work, but um, we show students uh, from outside of ISU the collection all the time. So one of my favorite things is when 12 system come to, uh, to, to the department and they see the collection. So these are actually students from Pocatello Charter School. And uh, these are Cornell drawers um, and uh, they fit into a Cornell cabinet. It's a very compact way to store 
and to um, curate invertebrates, especially pinned insects. And kids just love coming to see the collection. So um, every time we have a group of these, and usually uh, in one day we'll have three groups of 25 students, and uh, they'll come in with four or five adults, and they will, uh, even though they're very young, they're very respectful, and they have a lot of questions. They love coming and seeing the uh, insects. Uh, I, they like seeing the big, the big beetles and the, the uh, uh, praying mantises, and they love the spiders. And some of them go like, ooh, ooh, spiders, I don't like that. And, but you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a thrill ride. It's kind of like going to uh, the amusement park and going on a roller coaster, which is, you know, do you love it? Or do you, are you scared of it? And it, either way, it's very entertaining. Don't like insects or spiders, or they're afraid of them. Uh, they, they're still fascinating. One of the nicest things that I've taught uh, is that people who are comfortable with these organisms uh, very quickly lose their uh, uh, lose their fear of them. They become much more comfortable working with them. And after you've had to collect them and prepare them and study them and look at them under the microscope, uh, they, they don't hold any fear anymore. So learning about this is a great way for uh, students to expand their world. And another great thing about it is, is once you realize how many different kinds of of uh, insects and uh, arachnids there are, uh, you start to see more of them instead of just seeing a butterfly flying around and just forgetting about it, not even really thinking about it. Now, now after a class like this, you say, ooh, that's a, a tiger swallowtail, or that's a, uh, a Wiedermeyer's admiral, or that's a cabbage white butterfly. So, you know, it expands your world. It opens you up in ways that uh, uh, other kinds of education can only hope to do. So anyway, the kids love coming to see the, the collection, and we take the collection to them, too. So this is uh, me with uh, uh, those two cabinets right there, those two drawers at Idaho State. Celebrate Idaho State is held in February every year, and it's a, a showcase for the different departments. The biology department uh, that one year had uh, a couple of tables with people showing their uh, specimens or showing live organisms. And each year it's just gotten bigger and bigger. And just about every year I go, and uh, it, it is a kid magnet. Children love to come up and talk to us about it, and they point at the different insects. We'll play a little game, and I'll say, what's this? What's that? You'd be amazed at how many uh, different kinds of insects uh, they know and you know. If I show you a praying mantis, you know what that is. If I show you a big beetle, you know what that is. And uh, uh, some, some insects you, you might not recognize on site, but uh, the uh, invertebrates and the, uh, that I bring with me, every, everybody knows it. So right here is a, a sea star, also known as a starfish. And in the back, there are some vials with big arachnids. There's a tarantula in alcohol and so on. So they love coming to see it. This is uh, perhaps my favorite picture from that year. Uh, even the small children uh, are fascinated by these things. And I think that as an outreach and as education, this is important because uh, at some point, the, the interest in these things and the wonder gets beaten out of children and they're told, don't, don't touch it. Don't touch it, just step on it. And um, you know, they're taught to be afraid. And I think that a lot of the attitudes that people have, um, especially young adults, are culturally derived. These attitudes towards um, uh, especially spiders, uh, people just don't like them. And you ask them why, and they'll say, oh, they're icky. But they're, you know, for the most part, they're not. Now, on the other hand, though, I really love studying spiders. When they get to be about that big around, I go like, yeah, I'm not touching that. So they can be a little bit off-putting. Um, uh, the Right here, this uh, jar with the white top, that actually has a tarantula in it. I didn't bring it today because I'm at home. Uh, but uh, the tarantula was, I, first time I saw it, it was alive. A student brought it in, and they had it on their shoulder here. And uh, they, they had bought it. It was their pet. And they would actually pet it and stuff. They said, do you want to pet it? I said, no. And uh, at some point, though, the spider fell off. And just falling about that far is enough to, to harm a, a, a big spider like that. They're not meant to be on your shoulder and stuff. Anyway, it fell, it died, and then it got preserved and was donated to the collection. 
and it's the only tarantula that we have in the collection. And it's a really different kind of spider from all the other spiders. So having it was uh, really nice. But um, these were mostly collected by myself or by students. Um, the majority of what we have are insects and arachnids, but we have worms and clams and seashells from the seashore where my children and I would walk along the beach and collect seashells and then try and identify them. But uh, one of the reasons why we have so many insects is because there are so many of them. They're the largest group of invertebrates um, and they have the most species. So the insects are the most species group on the planet. They, uh, there are more known species of insects than of all plants and animal uh, groups. So uh, they're not only the most, the largest group of invertebrates, they're the largest group of all animals, vertebrates and invertebrates. And when you get right down to it, there's millions uh, or at least a million or so of insects, but there's like what? There's like 30,000 different mammals, 30,000 different birds. I don't know. They got a spine. I don't pay any attention to them. All right, so insects are the largest group. Arachnids are the next largest group of multicellular animals. So arachnids are uh, uh, different than insects. Uh, they're both arthropods. When we look at a, a graphic like this, this was purposely made to show just how big the group is. So the largest organism in this graphic is the house fly. And that's to represent the fact that the uh, insects are the largest group of organisms on the planet. And then here, right here, is a, a moose or an elk or something to represent the relative size, uh, if not importance, of mammals. And then this, this thing right here is a tick, representing the arachnids. Um, this is fish, worms, corals. These are the mollusks. When we get right down to it, the mollusks and the crustaceans might have more species, but it's hard to know because a lot of them are at the bottom of the ocean where we don't spend a lot of time. So if we were to go and sample the bottom of the ocean as much as we've sampled, say, North America or the tropical forests, we might find that these marine creatures were more species. But as it is right now, the majority of identified organisms, named organisms, are insects. And then the next biggest group are the arachnids. So insects are divided and they're arranged into orders. And we know the orders, um, uh, praying mantises and beetles and so on. So 29 orders of hexapods. And what do we mean by hexapods? Uh, well, it literally means joint, uh, six legs. So hexapods has got six legs. And uh, that's one way that we can tell arachnids from insects is because uh, the insects have got six legs and arachnids have eight legs. So as I said, we arranged these into 29 orders. Here's just five of those orders and they happen to be five of the largest orders. Uh, there's the Mantodea, pretty easy to understand. It's the praying mantises. Coleoptera, and I, I misspelled that, it's Coleoptera. Those are the beetles. Then there's the diptera. They have two wings. They're the true flies, things like house flies and fruit flies. And then there's hymenoptera, bees, wasps, and ants, and the lepidoptera. That's the butterflies and moths. So these are the kinds of insects that uh, we get a lot of when we have uh, class. So in both invertebrate zoology and in entomology, the students make a collection. And at the end of the semester, it forms part of their grade. In entomology, it's 40% of their grade. In invertebrate zoology, it's 5%. But what they do is they learn how to collect, they learn how to identify, and they're allowed to get any kind of invertebrate in invertebrate zoology. So they, get, they bring in worms and snails and all sorts of stuff like that. In entomology, though, it's mostly just the uh, uh, insects and arachnids and some other arthropods. So the arachnids, uh, have 10 orders of terrestrial arthropods with eight legs. So there are some arachnids, some spiders specifically, that uh, can hold a bubble around their body and they can go into the water and they can dive. They're called diving bell spiders. But in, they're all air breathers. 
just like insects. There are no marine insects. There are no uh, uh, insects at the bottom of the ocean. There are freshwater insects that live their entire life uh, as larvae and adults, uh, but there are no aquatic uh, arachnids. So that's why we say terrestrial arthropods with eight legs. And again, we know what these things are. Scorpions, uh, we have scorpions here in uh, Idaho. And if you wanna go to Gibson Jack or to uh, Barton Road, you can find scorpions. We have lots of mites and ticks. Uh, if you have a dog, you've probably uh, inadvertently had your dog collect some ticks for you. Uh, spiders and tarantulas, we have tarantulas here in Idaho. And then solifuji, I love saying that, solifuji. <laughs> Sounds like a Japanese word, but it really means camel spider. And camel spiders are a strange eight-legged arachnid. They look a little bit like um, uh, a Jerusalem cricket and a little bit like a scorpion. And then there's opiliones, the harvestman, or daddy long legs. So these are some of the, uh, these are five of the 10 uh, orders. And again, we arrange them in orders. Uh, once you realize that you're looking at this order and not that order, then it, it, you uh, can very quickly move on to, well, what family is it in? And then what, uh, what um, uh, genus is it? What species? So we have a bunch of those in the collection. They're all arthropods, as I said. They all have joint legs, and they all share a common ancestor. So uh, 600 million years ago, a long time ago, in the pre-Cambrian, um, Animals were developing that had distinct left and right sides. They were bilateral, and they're called the bilateria. And at some point, the bilateria became all of that common ancestor became all of the animals that we know, including us, that have distinct left and right sides. So at one time, the uh, before they diverged from other arthropods, they shared a common ancestor: the insects and arachnids. And by arthropod, we mean they have a jointed leg. That's what arthropod means. Uh, and they have an exoskeleton. So, you know, think of a crab or a lobster. That's a kind of crustacean. They have an exoskeleton that you have to crack open uh, to get at the, the yummy crab and lobster meat. And that's one of the reasons why I think people don't like spiders is because they don't taste good with melted butter. But they have, they have an exoskeleton and uh, insects and arachnids and all the other arthropods not only do they have this exoskeleton, like a, a crab shell or a lobster shell or the shrimp shell, but they have to shed that shell from time to time. So they have to molt. And uh, that puts them into another group uh, of organisms that all molt. But the arthropods all have the jointed legs and they have the exoskeleton and they have to molt. So those are characteristics that they all got from their common ancestor. But they have very different body types, don't they? So insects and arachnids have different body types because at one point they had the common ancestor and then at one point the spiders diverged from the common ancestor. They diverged from the main branch of the tree and then a little bit later on the insects diverged. And uh, we can see this in the fossil record in a couple ways. One is uh, when we look at terrestrial fossils uh, from 500 million years ago, 400 million years ago, we don't see them, we don't see them, we don't see them in different strata, and then boom, there they are. We see them. We start seeing these animals appear in the fossil record in what we know are probably terrestrial habitats. And we know they're terrestrial because there are other things that tell us that. There's uh, the kind of rock that the, the, uh, uh, ro that the formation was made from. But these uh, organisms, they diverged at different times, and that's why they have very different body parts. Um, we can see the easy, easy things. Uh, insects have six legs, that's the hexapods. And then arachnids, they have eight legs. And uh, another thing is, is that insects have three main body parts. We call these things um, tagmata. The insects have a, a well-defined head region, and then they have a body region, a thorax, and then at the end of the thorax, they have another body region called an abdomen. So they have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And they're, all of their legs are attached to the thorax. They're attached to that middle part. And then on their head, they have antennae. But when we look at a spider or any other kind of arachnid, they don't have antennae. 
That's one way in which they're really different. So they lost that as they diverged from the common ancestor. Um, they have two main body parts. Their cephalothorax is their head and their thorax. The, all of the legs are attached. All four pairs of legs are attached to the cephalothorax. Um, and then they have an abdomen. So uh, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with uh, what a spider looks like. It's got two main body parts. Insects have three. The insects have one pair of antennae, and arachnids have no antennae. When we look at the development of uh, embryos of arachnids and insects, we can see different genes being turned on and off in the developing head region. And we can see that different parts of their faces, their jaws, are made from similar points, similar sections and tissues, but they become different uh, they become different structures. Uh, one of the segments in the head of a developing insect becomes antennae. In the um, uh, arachnids, it becomes a different kind of tissue. Another way to uh, tell them apart is insects, for the most part, have chewing mandibles. Uh, now, lots of insects have uh, sucking mouth parts, um, and uh, or they have a, a they have a a, 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 a stylet, kind of like a hypodermic needle that they can use to suck uh, plant juices or even blood. Lots of the um, hemiptera, the true bugs, uh, they all have a sucking mouth part. Uh, but the mouth parts, the main mouth parts of arachnids are chelicerae. They're pinching mouth parts. And you can think of uh, the, the uh, fangs of a, of a spider. They hang down in front of their face, and at, at the bottom of them, they have the, uh, the fangs that have the poison for them to uh, subdue their prey. The difference between regular spiders, most spiders, is their fangs pinch together like this. In the tarantulas, their fangs uh, come out like this and come down. And that's uh, what divides the, the, the spiders from the tarantulas. But they have chelicery, mandibles and chelicery. That's the four main differences between these two groups. So um, there's, as I said, lots of them, and it takes some space to uh, store them all. Uh, this is just two of uh, the six or so Cornell cabinets. So uh, uh, people always ask me, they say, well, that's your name too. Uh, you know, are you related to them? I go like, only distantly. But uh, Cornell cabinets, these are Cornell drawers. And on the right here, they're arranged by order. Uh, the top one is Odinata, the dragonflies, damselflies. The next one down is uh, the praying mantises, the mantodea, and then the different orders of insects. But my uh, first interest was uh, butterflies. So the collection has lots of butterflies. This whole cabinet here is mostly butterflies arranged by family. So uh, the butterflies and moths are in the order Lepidoptera. So these are other insects in, uh, arranged by order. And then these right here are uh, mostly butterflies. So let's see what some of those look like. Um, when we open up the drawer, pull one out a little bit, we can see uh, swallowtail butterflies. So uh, these are very large, beautiful, kind of slow flying butterflies that fly like this. Other butterflies fly like this. Moths tend to We can see some close-ups of these. Uh, these are Western tiger swallowtails. So one of the places I really like to collect butterflies is at the parking lot of the West Fork of Mink Creek Trailhead. And you, at that trailhead, you can find three different species of these uh, tiger swallowtails. And we call them swallowtails because at the end of the hind wing, they have this uh, little finger coming out, if you can see it. So these four around the edge are Western tiger swallowtails, Papilia rutilus, and you can see why they call them a tiger swallowtail. They're yellow and with black stripes. But this one in the middle is one that I never saw or collected until last summer. And I've gone out to collect some more this summer. This is the anise swallowtail, Papilio zeliacon. And I went out there uh, uh, to collect just the other day. 
and I brought the uh, insect home. I, I managed to collect one of these anise swallowtails. They come out first, and then I, I brought it home and I pinned it. And so here's uh, the, the one that I got this year. So again, it's uh, one thing to go out and collect. It's another thing to spend the time to go out and prepare these things. And you'll notice in this illustration uh, from the, the collection that the, the wings are spread out. In real life, the wings are probably held up like this behind the, the butterfly or they're, they're held down like that. Uh, they, this is an unnatural way of presenting them, but we do it so that we can see all of the veins and all of the colors on the wings because we use that to identify them. You, you can see that this anise swallowtail has got a very different color pattern than the Western tiger swallowtail. So that's one way that we can, once you know, once you've been trained you, and once you've seen a collection like this, you don't need to collect them. You'll, you'll know what it is. So we pin the insects on a pinning board. So uh, the same day I went out, I got these insects. These are blue butterflies. They're little tiny blue butterflies. They're really hard to pin, by the way. They're easy to break. But they're on this spreading board. The spreading board has a groove down the middle. You put a pin through their abdomen, or actually through their thorax, and then you put them down in there. And people say, well, why do you do that? Why do you put the pin in? And it's because they're very delicate, especially when they're dry. So you don't handle the insect, you handle the pin. And if you want to look at them, you take the pin out and you put it into a piece of cork, and then you can manipulate the, the insect underneath the microscope to look at it. So we have to prepare these insects. Um, having a collection like this uh, allows us to do things like take really nice pictures of them. So if you uh, get a butterfly book, you can see these different images here. And that keeps you from having to make your own collection. You really don't want to make your own collection because where are you going to keep all of those Cornell drawers? So having a, a centralized place to have this, uh, you, you know, it's better to go to a museum than start your own. So these are Western tiger swallowtails, but then out at that same parking lot where I got the anise and the Western swallowtail, we get this one too, the Papilio multicaudata. So caudata or caudate means tail. Multi, of course, means multiple. And you can see that this is the two-tailed Western swallowtail. And down here at the bottom, on each one of these, they have the two tails. These three here are pinned right side up, so we see their, the top side of their wings. This one right here has been pinned upside down because sometimes what your, uh, the identifying characteristics are going to be on the bottom of the wing. And again, it's, uh, it's difficult to get them to pin out this nicely. Um, these are ones that I either pinned out or the students in my classes did. And it's tough to keep those little tiny delicate tails from being ripped off. So um, in one spot, you can stand there and get three different species of these big, or at least see three different species of these big, very attractive butterflies. The uh, uh, Western tiger swallowtail, though, here is, I live near Holt Arena, and it's, it flies around my neighborhood. So once you know what they are, you can appreciate them better. Once you start looking for them, or maybe get a book and start reading about them, then you can start to appreciate them without having to capture them. Because frankly, running around with a butterfly net is a good way to make your neighbors think you're, you're completely nuts. All right, so this is another swallowtail. It's not actually a swallowtail. It's in the same family, the Papillionidae. Papillio is the French word for butterfly. Um, this is Parnassius clodius that I uh, collected uh, a couple years ago in Big Sky, Montana. This is called a snow Apollo. Parnassus was it is a mountain in Greece. It's the mountain where Apollo, the, the Greek god, was supposed to live. And so these are actually called snow Apollos because they live up in the mountainside. And it is uh, more closely related, even though they don't have a swallowtail, these are papillionids. They're in the papilio family. Let's see what else we have. So those drawers, uh, that, all of the butterflies are in one cabinet. The other insects, uh, are in the other cabinet I was showing you. These are uh, bees, wasps, and ants. So this is in the Hymenoptera. And again, we're familiar with all of these things. We've seen bees and wasps. We've uh, all been stung by bees and wasps. 
By the way, what is more deadly? To be stung by a bee, to be bitten by a tick, or to be bitten by a spider? A lot of people say, ooh, ooh, spiders will kill you. Uh, and people might say, well, ticks will give you Lyme disease. But the truth is about 90 people a year in the United States die from being stung by a bee or wasp, whereas nobody dies from uh, uh, spider bites. It's uh, blown out of proportion, again, because people just don't like spiders. Uh, if you get bitten by a tick, you might get Lyme disease. If the question was, What's, what costs the US taxpayer more, being uh, killed by a wasp or being bitten by a, a tick with Lyme disease? It'd have to be tick because people spend a lot of their lives sick with Lyme disease, maybe, maybe not even know it. So anyway, this is the kind of thing that we talk about in my classes. Anyway, these are, uh, uh, this is a collection of bees, wasps, and ants. Here's a, a close up of some bumblebees. Some of my favorites, I really like the, the ones that have the orange on their, uh, the end of their abdomens. They're very big and furry, very cute looking. You'll notice that they're not only pinned, but each specimen has a series of labels underneath it. And the labels tell us where they were collected, when and who collected them. And then sometimes we, we figure out what they are. We try to identify them. And then that label goes on. And then in a, a collection like this, we arrange them by species, or at least by uh, the family. So uh, this is a work that's always moving forward. You're always working to uh, improve the information. This is a close-up of uh, uh, some wasps that were sent to us by Grandma Bobby from Iowa. So this one student in my class, she was a very good student. She said, my, my grandma got some wasps. Can I keep them in my collection? I said, sure. So uh, during spring break uh, in 2018, this student went home, or 2019, went home and brought these uh, back uh, from Iowa, and they're now in our collection. And they're dead. Uh, that's one of the questions that students always ask, are they dead? They're like, well, you'd be dead too if you had a big pin through you. But uh, in a collection like this, we can keep uh, all sorts of stuff. We can keep the nests and the egg cases. And uh, what we do is we uh, uh, kill them in a killing jar with ethyl acetate. It's the same chemical in nail polish removal. And, or we'll drown them in ethanol. And uh, then usually what will happen is the specimens will get put into a freezer. And that will kill any uh, small insects or mites that might be on the, the specimens. Because we don't want those living creatures uh, in, the, in the Cornell drawers they might actually damage them. So after they've been preserved, uh, we put them, mount them on a piece of cardstock or on a pin, and that's how we keep them in the collection. Uh, I thought this was a particularly nice group because the closed cells here are where there were larvae still in the nest. And then these two workers were caught, uh, they were killed while they were on the, the nest uh, working. Let's see what else we have, we have beetles. And uh, again, they're all arranged by different species. Um, and you can see these little white cards here. I've been going through the collection and adding these cards so you don't have to take them out and pick up the pin and look at that little teeny tiny label. The bigger label tells you what, your, uh, what species we're looking at. For example, this is Polyphagia decimalinata. And uh, this is the 10 lined June bug. And in about another three weeks, we'll start seeing these around our houses. And we'll also see the May, May bugs and June bugs too. They're brown and uh, a, a smaller than these. These things are about that big. They're about as big as the end of my thumb. And very cool. You'll notice that the wings are spread very often to tell the difference between one species and another or one genus and another. You have to spread the wing out and you have to count things like the number of veins. You can see the strong veins here. And then in between the two veins, there'll be a cross vein. So for example, with uh, uh, dragonflies, you count the number of cross veins. Does it have 13 cross veins or does it have nine or fewer cross veins? So spreading the wings out is one of the techniques that we learn when we're preparing insects. Uh, this is where I do a lot of that work. This is uh, the prep room. Uh, 
inside of the laboratory that I showed you where the students were working. And uh, it's got a functional hood. Uh, this cabinet in the back, uh, the top four drawers are filled with vials. There's about, um, let's see, eight times 60, that's 480. So there's about 500 vials in each one of these drawers. So that's about 2,000 total capacity. But really, there's about 1,000 little tiny glass uh, bottles in there that are filled with alcohol and have, have some arachnid in them. So scorpions and ticks and mites and all sorts of other stuff. I love it when students bring me ticks. If uh, Sometimes I'll have a student that works for a vet and they'll say, do you want this thing? And I'll go, oh yeah. So they bring us, the, I know, everybody's going like, oh, I don't like that. And they, I don't want them crawling on me, but I'm always fascinated. Sometimes people will bring me bed bugs. I'll go, this is a bed bug. And I'll go, yeah, where'd you find it? And they'll say, I'm my grandma. And I'll go like, ah, you're, so you, you need to talk to your mom and dad and tell them grandma's house needs to be fumigated. Anyway, so um, we keep some of the uh, insects in, uh, and most of the arachnids in little jars of alcohol. I wish I had some here with me to show you. I really am interested in studying arachnids. It's uh, it took me about six months to just begin. And uh, these white cabinets up here have reference material in them. So you have a book that will help you get to the family. And then you uh, look at them under a big scope. This is a honking big microscope. It's a dissecting scope. It goes up to about 100 power, which is, uh, which is very powerful for a dissecting scope. And you need that because you need to look at these very small details, about the size of the head of a pin. And uh, the uh, references that I have say, does it have this? Does it have this many hairs on this leg? Does it have two claws? Does it have three claws at the end of each leg? How are the eyes arranged? And you can see most of that um, at, at, you know, at 10 power or with a regular little hand uh, magnifying glass. But when you get to the species, you usually have to identify them using their uh, male and female genitalia. Uh, I'm going to show you just uh, one of these things. This is the pedipalp of a male spider. So it's easy to tell male from female spiders when they're mature. The males hanging in front of their face, they have a couple of arms. And at the end of the arms, they have what some people call boxing gloves. And these are the pedipalps. They are the mature um, uh, sexually reproductive structures for the male. And they usually have a little finger called a conductor. And what they do is they reach down with their pedipalp to their uh, cloaca, which is near their spinnerets, and they suck up a drop of sperm, and then they use that conductor to uh, inseminate a female. It's the lock and key model. The species are kept separate because this key does not fit this lock. So species A male cannot mate with species B. It just, it doesn't physically work. So that's the way we keep them separate. What it also makes these genitalia very important for identification. At the very end, if you can't see mature, well-defined genitalia with all the structures, you, you, you don't know what you're looking at. So I wanted to show you what one of these things look like. This is a picture from that great big microscope. And you can see that this very tiny structure has got lots of, of architecture. And you have to be able to say, well, does it have two prongs right here? Or does it have one prong or no prongs? Does it have any kind of structures coming off of the arm right here? So uh, that's one of the things that uh, I spend my time doing. Um, and then, of course, I like to go out and collect. Now is a good time to go out and see stuff. And one of the things that you can see nowadays is this. So I'm going to leave you with just a couple more ideas about insects. This is a, a, a gall on big sagebrush, Artemisia tridentata. Everybody's got a, 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 some place nearby where they can go and see sagebrush. And at this time of year, you see these structures. They were formed by an insect. The, in, the, the mother laid an egg on the sagebrush and uh, the chemicals from the mother or from the larvae, from the developing egg, take over the machinery of the plant and force it to create this structure here. This is called a medusa gall. Medusa, of course, was the, uh, the monster from Greek mythology that had snakes for hair. So this is a Medusa gall, and developing inside of this is a tiny midge called a, uh, 
uh, a gall midge. And the species is Ropoliomaya uh, medusa. And so this one's pretty common. And of course, this one also is pretty common this time of year. This is Ropoliomaya uh, pomum. Pomum in Latin means apple. So it's kind of shaped like an apple, a little bit red. If you open it up, it's just spongy hair inside. Um, I could, uh, I've got one, uh, not of Ropalia Maya uh, pomum, but of Medusi, and I'll just bring it a little closer here. You can see this thing. Pay attention. You're getting very sleepy. Anyway, um, this thing, if I were to rip it open, would be um, uh, the nest, if you will, of uh, a midge. So a single egg gets laid, the egg develops into a larvae, the larvae's chemicals take over the machinery of the, the cells in the plant and force it to create these structures. The structure becomes a home and very often provides food for the developing larvae. And then later on, they, they uh, uh, escape as adults and go on to lay their eggs. They mate and lay their eggs on another sagebrush somewhere. So this is the kind of thing that you can see uh, this time of year. Uh, if you find something out in uh, nature and you take a picture of it, uh, try and take a good picture, take a good close-up picture, and send it to me, and I'll see if I can't uh, tell you what it is. If you find something in your home and you want to know what it is, or in your backyard, uh, people send me uh, requests for identification all the time, and I'm always happy to do it. If you collect something, uh, put it in a little baggie, uh, maybe pour in some rubbing alcohol, and you can, uh, well, it used to be you could drop it off at the, uh, at the biology department, but now, um, you know, just send me a picture. And uh, I'll put my uh, uh, email on here uh, in a bit. Now that's about all I got. I, I included these two about galls, these two images of galls, because I think they're fascinating. And they're insects. You see them on a plant. The relationship between plants and insects is like that. And uh, there are a couple of uh, resources that if you're still interested in doing this, you can look at. Uh, one of which is bugguide.net. If you go to bugguide.net, and I think I've got it up here, um, if you go to bugguide.net and you say, uh, I've got a black butterfly, or just type in big beetle, blue beetle, blue beetle on milkweed, um, you know, it's going to show you pictures of all sorts of insects and spiders from North America. And then the other one is inaturalist.org. Um, I don't know if uh, anybody out there is using iNaturalist, but you take a picture with your phone, you upload it to inaturalist.org and someone will try and identify it for you. And then that picture becomes part of the database. It's like another teaching and research collection that you are helping to contribute to. And you just have to take a picture. You don't have to actually collect the uh, insect. And you can uh, take a picture of anything. All right. And then the last thing I'm going to add here is J Cornell at isu.edu. So if you would like to send me a picture of the creepy crawly that you just found, I would be thrilled. And that's all I've got for today. So uh, this is Joseph Cornell from the Department of Biological Sciences, and I would be happy to take your questions if you have any. We do have one question right now. Um, someone's wondering if a centipede is an insect. It's a really good question. So centipedes have lots of legs. Uh, centa usually means something like a hundred. And then there's millipedes. Millipedes have thousands of legs. So, um, well, they don't have thousands, they have hundreds. But millipedes and centipedes are in another group. So there's the insects, the arachnids, and then there's the myriapodes. So a myriad is a Greek word that means 10,000. And the, the centipedes and millipedes don't have 10,000 legs but those legs are jointed and they do have mandibles. So they're uh, thought to have been, for the longest time, more closely related to uh, insects. Even uh, some people thought that maybe centipedes and millipedes evolved from insects, but was probably the other way around. So centipedes are arthropods. And if you take a class in invertebrate zoology, you, you see them and you collect them. If you take a class in entomology, uh, I allow them in my collection, in the collections, because uh, they are arthropods too. So they're terrestrial arthropods. It's not just about insects in entomology, although entomology is the study of insects. So very good question. 
Any other questions? Um, I actually have a couple. Okay. <laughs> um, the museum, as part of you know caring for the collections, we do our we have we call it our pest control, right? So we have our little pest traps. It would be great if your students would help us identify what we catch in these traps so that we know what um, is crawling in our basement. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, I can it's just got a lot of spiders. That's <laughs> right. So um, some spiders like living in our house. Some spiders don't ever really come in our house. Um, it's very rare to find black widow spiders in our, in our houses, but around our houses, yes. And cat face spiders, it's uh, in the fall, you may see them uh, making a web in a corner of a, outside of your window. But inside our houses, we have jumping spiders and sometimes we'll have wolf spiders. And there's a little yellow spider uh, called Chiracanthum mildii. That's very common in our houses. And then there are hobo spiders. And I'm surprised no one asked a question about hobo spiders because we have them. Everybody's house has got them. Every building on campus at ISU campus has got them. The museum has got them. And I would be willing to bet that when you uh, look at that little sticky trap, it's one of those little cardboard boxes, right? So uh, things crawl in and they can't crawl out. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there were millipedes and centipedes. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were hobo spiders. I'd be really surprised if there's, there's some of these others. We get, uh, we also get silverfish. Right. And um, these little flying ones that I can't think of what they are right now. They're little gnat type things. Right. So uh, that's, that's a good one. You know, uh, you don't have to use a box trap to find these things in your house. You have, we all have a couple of traps always working in our house. You go into your kitchen and you take the cover off of the light above your kitchen sink and it's always got something in it. And some of it's going to be those little teeny tiny flies. And people say, well, you know, what do the uh, spiders in our houses eat? And I go, that stuff. They eat those little tiny flies. So, yeah, there's uh, gnats and maybe fruit flies. Um, in the, a building like that, uh, there might be a, a, another kind of insect called a earwig. Mm -hmm. And so that's in the order Dermaptera. The silverfish are in an order called Archaeonatha. They're one of the oldest groups of wingless insect. And that's something I didn't mention. Uh, insects are the only flying invertebrates. They're the only in, uh, organisms that ever developed wings in the invertebrate world. But um, typically students will, in my class, will get 12 to 18 different orders. And if they get a silverfish, I'm always thrilled. <laughs> well, they can come down and get some of ours. They, yeah, that's um, right. Because they, as you know, they do like organics and um, the anthropology right. collection is full of organics. So we, right. we try very hard to keep those um, under control. Yeah. The thing that we're the most worried about is um, some uh, kind of beetle larvae called a dermestid beetle. Mm -hmm. So dermestid beetles, they eat dead organic material. And uh, in nature, they help dispose of all sorts of, of uh, uh carrion and dead things. So in nature, they're perfectly fine. If you go and you see a, a, dead, a dead deer by the side of the road, it's just loaded up with all sorts of larvae of flies and so on, and there'll be domestic beetles. But the thing about these Cornell drawers, is they have very tight fitting lids. The tight fitting lid is to keep out uh, miniature livestock that are going to eat your collection. And when you see older collections, and I've seen this in many places, you'll look at it and you'll see, uh, you'll see dust. You'll see frass from where the larvae have pooped uh, out the parts of the insects that they've eaten. So we have a, a Cornell drawer with a tight fitting lid. Very often we'll put a chemical inside of the drawer itself to, to discourage these insects. And then we keep them in those Cornell cabinets um, where uh, we can also put in some uh, chemical to prevent uh, other insects from coming in. But it's a constant struggle. You have to be very careful with any kind of organic collection because domestic beetles and other insects will eat plants and animal, uh, preserved animals in your collection. Um, 
when you find something like this, if it's something you want to keep, you put the you put the affected specimens into a freezer. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I showed you uh, the specimens I just collected and just pinned. So uh, they've been collected and pinned. This is a stone fly. That's the anise swallowtail. And then over the orange tip uh, white butterfly is a pierrid butterfly. Anyway, after I, now that I've pinned them, this whole box will go into a, a freezer for a couple weeks. And you bring it out, let it warm up, and then you put it back. And the reason why you freeze it twice is some organisms are adapted to the cold. And they'll, they'll, uh, they'll hunker down while it's cold the first time. But then when it warms up, they go like, oh, it's time to become an adult. And then you put them back in and, and thwart that. So, yeah, there's, there's uh, stuff in every building. And, again, if you find something in your house and you are worried about it or you'd like to know what it is, please send me a picture. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, All right. I, really, I really appreciate you joining us today. Um, mm -hmm. And I look forward to when we can get together and um, have a tour of your collection up at the biology building. It looks awesome. When, when, the, when, the, when campus opens up again, I'd be pleased to, to do that, <laughs> especially for Cub Scout groups, birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, whatever. <laughs> well, it sounds like fun, Joe. Right. Thank you. Thanks. You it have a great pleasure afternoon. talking with you today. Thank yep. you. Bye-bye. Yep.